Good morning, everyone. I just want to say welcome once again. Thank you all for coming today. We're glad to have you. Before we get started, I just want to have a quick prayer. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for another day and for a time that we can come together in fellowship. And uh, we pray that this time would be um, a blessing for us and, and pleasing to you. Uh, pray that um, you would speak to us right now, God, and um, helps to hear what you have to say. Pray for people that are traveling, for Randy and for Lydia as they're, they're getting ready to leave today. Give them a safe trip. Pray for others that are either coming back or traveling today. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't need a show of hands, but does anyone here have pets? My daughter loves cats, and sometimes you'll see her wearing cat t-shirts or talking about cats. And She loves our cat, and she loves holding our cat, Libby. But Libby is not a cat that really likes to be held. She's the type of cat that if you, if you pick her up, she'll kind of like look for any sort of way to jump away. Like if she feels like you're loosening your grip, she'll take that window of opportunity and she'll leap out. She's not really mean about it. Like she won't like hiss or, or scratch or, or bite, but she just doesn't want to be held. But that doesn't, that doesn't deter our, our daughter Olivia though. She'll, she'll pick up Libby, and Libby will start meowing, and it's this very kind of sad, forlorn type of meow, like just kind of like a, a sad protest. And when we hear that, that's how we know that, that Olivia is holding the cat. And it's happened quite a few times now that, you know, even we don't have to see her holding the cat. We hear that meow, and we know that, that she's holding the cat. We could be in another room, and we just say, you know, put down the cat, you know, because we know what's going on. And now she's at the point where as soon as we tell her to put the cat down, she'll put the cat down and say, oh, I'm not holding the cat. Look, you, know, you don't have to tell me because look, I'm not holding the cat. And technically it's true, but she knows she's not supposed to hold the cat in the first place. But she does it and then she denies that she's ever doing it. And we continually tell her just to respect the cat's wishes and, and don't pick up the cat. But she just can't resist like a fuzzy, furry, lovable cat. So we're not too strict about it. Today's message isn't about cats, though. It's, it is about trying to do what you're supposed to do, though. And the story that, that we're going to look at is found in Genesis 38. It's in the middle of the Joseph story. It happens after Joseph gets sold by his brothers and before the events with Potiphar's wife. Even though it's one chapter, it covers a fairly long period of time. And it seems out of place, too. It's, it's a departure from the story of Joseph, and it's also probably one of the less popular stories we read in the Bible. But when you think about the stories of the Old Testament, this is one that probably gets passed over. And There have been movies made about Moses and Joseph, but not about the characters in today's story. It's not one that you'll find in the children's Bible, most likely, because it has, it has awkward and, and uncomfortable themes. And in a lot of ways, it reads like a reality show. But let's pick up in Genesis chapter 38. We're we'll start by looking at the first five verses. You can follow along if you want, or you can look up at the screen. It says, And it came about the time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named, her, named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son, and named him Onan. She bore still another son, and named, it Shilla, named him Shilla. And it was a Kezib that she bore him. <clears throat> in the chapter before, in Genesis 37, Judah and his brothers get tired of Joseph and all his boasting, and all the favor treatment by their father, Jacob, and so they, they end up selling him to a group of Ishmaelites. Sometime after that, Judah, one of Joseph's older brothers, moves away and gets married and has three sons, Ur, Ur Onan, and Shelah. It doesn't say why he moves, but maybe he felt guilty about everything that happened with Joseph. Maybe he needed a change of scenery. But he was, went looking for a wife in Cana, which was not a good choice. 
The Canaanites were constant antagonists to God's people throughout the Bible. And God warned his people not to marry from the Canaanites because they believed in other gods. But Judah did anyway. And in any case, our story today seems pretty normal so far, but let's keep reading. I'm going to go to the next couple of verses, verses 6 to 10. It says, Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife, perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. These verses are where the story gets a little bit more complicated. It says that Judah's oldest son gets married, but before he and his wife Tamar have children, he dies because of his wickedness. We don't know what he did, but it must have been fairly serious. It says that Ur left behind his wife, but no children. And once Ur dies, Judah tells his second son, Onan, to step up and marry Tamar, his older brother's wife, and to start a family with her. But it says that Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so he didn't allow Tamar to conceive. As a result, God took his life as well. And if it seems odd that Onan would marry his sister-in-law and start a family with her, we'll, we'll talk about that later. It certainly doesn't fit into our Western ideas of marriage and family. The verses also say that even if Onan and Tamar would have had children, they would not be considered Onan's children. And that seems odd too, that Onan could have a child with Tamar and it wouldn't be considered his, but more on that later. Let's continue on to verse 11. Does this thing turn off after a period of time? Oops. I'll read it out loud. It says, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. So after his first two sons died, we, we, we read that Judah now has one son left, but this time he handles things differently. Instead of telling the next son in line, his last son, Shelah, the same thing he told Onan to step up and marry Tamar, he says, he tells Tamar to go live a widow, as a widow in her father's house, and he doesn't push his last son to marry Tamar and start a family with her. Why? Well, because he already lost two sons and he didn't want to lose this last one. Perhaps Sheila was, in fact, too young to get married, but it could be, and maybe more likely so, that he was all grown up and just immature. Verse 11 says that Judah was afraid that Sheila would die like his brothers, which leads me to believe that he was old enough to get married. It sounds like Judah was covering for Sheila and didn't want to lose another son. So as a result, Tamar has to go home and live with her parents again. And as we continue reading, it seems like Judah never intends to have Sheila marry Tamar. We're going to pick up in verse 12. Oops. <laughs> I think we're battling back and forth. Um, verse 12, it says, Now after considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to the sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adelamite, and it was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. So in verse 12, we read that a number of years have passed. Judah's wife dies. So now Judah is a widower. He has one unmarried son at home and a daughter-in-law living with her parents. But look at verse 13. It refers to Judah as Tamar's father-in-law, despite the fact that her husband is dead. And if you look back at verse 11, which we won't go back, I'll just 
Keep reading. It says, Judah tells Tamar to remain a widow in your father's house. Verse 13 refers to Judah as Tamar's father-in-law. In verse 11, Judah calls Tamar a widow. So which one is right? Is Tamar truly a widow like Judah maintains? Or is she still related to Judah and Sheila the, through marriage, with, even with Ur being dead? If it sounds confusing, it is for us, but it was not uncommon for people in that time. And before we look at all the details of marriage in the early history of the Bible, let's look at some of the influences and some of the ramifications at play in this story. Judah's family tree is about to end because it says that Sheila, Sheila has now grown up and Tamar is living with her parents. Tamar has not been given to Sheila as his wife. And maybe Judah is intentionally keeping Sheila single while knowing that he's supposed to marry her. Maybe he's afraid that if he does marry her, he'll die too and he'll be left with, with no sons. Maybe he also thinks that if his last son marries someone else, God will strike him down too. In any case, Judah and Sheila both know what's supposed to happen, but they're dragging their feet. They force Tamar to return home as a widow and are simply burying their heads in the sand. If Sheila doesn't get married, though, and doesn't have kids, then how will Judah's lineage continue? Judah and Sheila might have thought their inactivity was going unnoticed, but apparently not because people around them, the people in the town, certainly probably Tamar's family, were waiting for Judah and Sheila to do the right thing. What leads me to believe that is that it says in verse 13, it was told to Tamar, behold your father-in-law. It seems like someone's kind of keeping an eye out. Someone knows what's going on. It's kind of keeping Tamar informed. And whoever said that to Tamar was giving her heads up and refers to Judah as her father-in-law, even though she wasn't married to one of Judah's sons at the time, at least not as how we understand marriage. And it may seem that the rest of the townspeople kind of knew what was going on. Judah and Sheila might have buried their heads in the sand, but people around them saw that there was an injustice. Was Judah really willing to let his family line die out? Was he, allow, was he going to allow his last son to remain unmarried, not have kids? What we read is that Tamar wasn't willing to let that happen. She was preparing to save Judah's family tree and establish a family for herself so she wouldn't have to live as a quote-unquote widow for the rest of her life. Verse 14 says that Tamar removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and sat in a place where she would be seen says that she noticed that Sheila had finally grown up after all these years and was still living as a bachelor in Judah's house. And if you thought things were strange up until now, they continue to get even stranger. Tamar now has a plan to make things right. Let's keep reading. At the point where we pick up in verse 15, Judah is on the road with one of his friends. It says, when Judah saw her, Tamar, he thought she was a harlot for she had covered her face. So he turned aside by her by the road and said, Here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, Moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give you? She said, Your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adullamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of the place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who is here by the road at Enaim? But they said, there has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, there has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. So a little bit ago, I said that Tamar had a plan to make things right. And you're right to feel confused if you're surprised by the, the plan that she devised. Tamar has changed her clothes and she's dressed up in a veil. 
like a prostitute, and she placed herself where Judah will pass by, and she probably actively tried to seduce him. Judah sees Tamar as he's passing by, but doesn't recognize her. He offers her a young goat, but she very wisely asks for a pledge. I mean, he didn't have the goat with him, but he promises a goat, and she says, well, how do I know you're going to you know, send a goat? So she convinces him to give her some personal items as a pledge. And she really doesn't have much reason to trust him at this point, so she was pretty wise in doing that. So Judah agrees to give her his personal items, and afterwards, Tamar changed back into her widow's garments and returned home. And it says that Tamar became pregnant. We do read on, later on that Judah does keep his word, and he attempts to send the young goat as a way to get back his personal items. Only no one can find the, the quote-unquote prostitute he's looking for. So Judah is again in kind of a sticky situation, and when he's faced with doing the right thing, he does something completely wrong. He's afraid of looking bad, so he stops trying to find the quote-unquote prostitute, and he stops trying to recover his personal items. What's worse is that he's not taking responsibility for his actions. In fact, he kind of projects his bad behavior onto others because he says, we, we will become a laughing stock, not just him. I mean, he's the one that got him into this situation, and now he's acting like he's concerned about others as well. I mean, maybe he's thinking about he and his son will become a laughing stock. And if you look again at verse 16, I'm not going to scroll back, but it's another reference to Tamar as Judah's daughter-in-law. Let's keep reading and see if we can kind of figure out where this story is going. Picks up again in verse 24. It says, Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, Your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold... She is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I. And as much as I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not have relations with her. It came about at the time she was giving birth that, behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth. One put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. Then she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and he was named Zerah. So verse 24 going back looks like it starts with what sounds like another rumor. Someone tells Judah that his daughter-in-law is pregnant and all of a sudden Judah gets furious and calls for her to be burned. And she's only saved because she brings out Judah's personal items and says that the owner of these items is the father of this baby. And it's not until this point that Judah finally admits that he has been wrong all along. And again, he says it kind of in a funny way, in kind of a twisted way. He manages to call himself righteous. He's really stealing credit from Tamar by saying that she's more righteous than him. After all that has transpired in this story, all of Judah's deceit and avoiding doing what he was supposed to do, and getting involved with someone he thought was a prostitute, and somehow he considered himself righteous. And then you also might wonder, when is it righteous for someone to dress up like a prostitute and seduce your father-in-law? And again, this is where it sounds like a reality show. And then you wonder, like, how does a story like this end up in the Bible? And then how does it get put right in the middle of the Joseph story? But it's important to consider some of the ins and outs of marriage in those days. And there was a precedent. In fact, it later became a law for this type of situation. It was created to protect widows and preserve family lines. Later on in the Bible, this law regarding what happens to a woman whose husband dies is explained and it's found in Deuteronomy. It was uh, referred to as leveret marriage. I'm going to bring up that verse right now. It's in Deuteronomy 
25, verses 5 and 6. It was recorded in Deuteronomy, which happens after Genesis, but the way this story reads, it sounds like this was already kind of understood before that. It says, When brothers live together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. <coughs> the Leveret marriage was designed to protect widows, and it also allowed them to have the opportunity to have a family and an inheritance. When Ur died, Tamar should have had a family with Onan, but he refused to do his duty to provide a firstborn child for Tamar and his dead brother. So you might wonder why did Onan refuse, and I think there were several reasons. In, in those days, the firstborn son in a family, someone like Ur, was set up to inherit the lion's share of the father's estate and also receive the blessing of a firstborn. The other sons, which would have been Onan and Shelah in this story, would have received less. So Ur as the firstborn would have stood to inherit a large share of Judah's possessions when he died. And that would have been passed on to his firstborn, Ur's firstborn, had he had one. Once Ur died, then Onan would have been considered the firstborn. So it seems like part of Onan's sin at that time was greed because if, when Ur died without an heir, Onan assumed the firstborn status, and then he would have been the one to inherit more and not Ur's son or Ur's family. <clears throat> that might have been why he would have been reluctant to have a child with Tamar. And then after Onan died, Shelah was left as the only remaining son of Judah. But Judah res refused to give Tamar to Shelah, so Judah refused Tamar the right to be married to someone who would have inherited something. Not only that, she was sent back to live with her parents. And as a woman living with her parents, she would not have been in line to receive anything from her parents. That would have gone to Tamar's oldest brother. So Judah was complicit in robbing Tamar of marrying someone that would have inherited something. He forced her to go home as a quote-unquote widow and receive nothing. So the fact that Judah and his sons broke the law of leveret marriage was a big deal. It was serious enough, serious enough that God struck down Onan for ignoring that law. And you might think that maybe Judah should have died too, but God had another plan for him. And it was only when Tamar took matters into her own hands that Judah realized how wrong he had been. Tamar went to extreme measures to ensure that Judah didn't weasel his way out of doing what he and his sons should have done. Tamar had every right to have children with either Shelah or Judah according to the law of leveret marriage especially in light of those two shirking their responsibilities and forcing her to live as a widow. Everyone else around them also recognized how wrong Judah and Sheila were and seemed to be helping Tamar. And in the end, Tamar is called more righteous. I'm still not sure where Judah gets off calling himself righteous unless he was considering that how he finally, if unwillingly, fulfilled his duty to provide children to Tamar. When we read a story like this, the parts relating to the, the trickery and the prostitution come across stronger than anything else. And at first glance, we're probably surprised that, that a woman who poses as a prostitute and tricks her father-in-law into conceiving a child would be called righteous. It seems to fly in the face of what we read in the Bible and other parts. But Tamar never actually was a prostitute, even if she just as one. She was within her right to have a family with Judah since Judah was bound by leveret marriage to provide children in the absence of other males in the family. At the same time, it fits right in with how everyone else in the Bible, it seems, except Jesus has serious character flaws. Practically every person of significance, except Jesus, has committed enormous sins and probably deserved to be struck down by God. Yet God continued to work through these same people and accomplished remarkable, miraculous things through them. Later on in Genesis, we read that, that Judah also rebounded from this low point in his life. 
It says later in the Joseph story, when Joseph is in charge of distributing food during the famine, Judah and his brothers, the ones that sold Joseph into slavery, they show up in front of Joseph asking for food. Joseph refuses to sell them food until Judah and his brothers bring back another one of their brothers, Benjamin. Their father, Jacob, initially refused to send Benjamin with them, but Judah steps up and he says, I'll be responsible for Benjamin. You can hold me responsible if anything happens to Benjamin. Later on, when Benjamin does go back with them to Joseph, Judah offers to become Joseph's slave in place of Benjamin. So we see that Judah eventually tries to do some of the right things. Later on in the Bible, Judah is also the namesake of what became the tribe of Judah and eventually the kingdom of Judah and an ancestor of Jesus. Consider this, if Judah never has any children, if Tamar didn't do what she did, and Judah never has children, we would not have the 12 tribes of Israel. We would have maybe the, the 11 tribes of Israel. And Jesus would have had to descend from another tribe. Also in Matthew chapter 1, where it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, it includes Tamar's name. And that's kind of cool and probably an affirmation that Tamar acted appropriate for that time. But it's nothing for this day or age because leveret marriage is no longer applicable for us. In another passage of the Bible, in 1 Chronicles 4.21, we find that even Sheila seems like turned things around. In one of the genealogies of 1 Chronicles, it lists the son of Sheila. He had several sons, but the first one was named Ur. So it seems in the end, he eventually complied with Leveret marriage, and he had a son with Tamar, and he named that son Ur, and that became his late brother's heir. So what sorts of things can we learn from like a passage like this? A passage that talks about a lot of uncomfortable things and uncomfortable topics and, and deals with things that we would never consider to be righteous today. I think the first thing is that Jesus speaks into our, our disgrace. It says, God starts with broken people and accomplishes great things. Being broken is almost a prerequisite for eventual success in the Bible. Abraham, Moses, Jacob, David, and Paul were all horribly flawed. And you can find flaws in everyone in the Bible except Jesus. But Jesus is a special case because even though he was sinless, he was generally not recognized in his time for his greatness. He was underestimated. He was considered weak or an underdog by many. But even though he was perceived as an underdog, obviously he wasn't as, as Jesus was still, was still God, but many people wrote him off. But those are the type of people that God chooses in order to show his greatness. Because if God can accomplish great things through with a broken underdog weakling, then how much greater does that make God? And that should give us a great sense of hope that God can work in our lives too, despite our brokenness. I think it's also to, to realize that there's, there's great good in, in humbly admitting our inability to save ourselves. <clears throat> it took Judah a long time to, to realize this. But the great good is that, you know, when we humble ourselves and we realize that there isn't anything we can do, it's good news and it's bad news. And the bad news is that, well, we're all broken. But the good news is that God wants to fix us. So more bad news is that sometimes it takes weeks, months, or years to right our ship. But more good news is that through these tough times, it gives us an opportunity to grow our faith. And if we allow God to work in our lives, God will reward our faith. We just have to have enough faith not to give up. Pastor Randy has recently preached that during difficult times we shouldn't ask God to change our circumstances but rather change our hearts and that's part of the healing or fixing process. Maybe our hearts aren't sufficiently changed to accept our current situations but fixing a heart takes time. God does want to fix us though and prepare us for great things. It's also one thing for us to want to change but we have to realize that we can't create real change on our own. <clears throat> 
if you ever feel like if you've ever feel like you're stuck in the mud and you're spinning your wheels, it's probably because you're trying to get out of the mud on your own strength. And if you've ever really been stuck in the mud, you know that spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels sometimes just sinks you further into the mud and gets you even more stuck. And eventually you need someone else to push or pull you out. And in most cases we need, God, we need God to get us out of the proverbial mud when we get stuck so we don't sink in even farther. Finally, I think the last important message from this passage is that we're compelled to graciously love one another as we are graciously loved. Just as God doesn't give up on Judah, he doesn't give up on us. And we aren't allowed to give up on one another either. To sit back and pretend that we aren't like others, that we aren't broken, that we don't need fixing or saving is false. And once we remember that we've all fallen short of God's expectations and we've all received forgiveness, that we should, be quick, we should be quick to offer forgiveness and acceptance to others. So I ask today, what are the areas of brokenness in your life? In what ways are you, you spinning your wheels and sinking even farther into the mud? If God could fix just one thing in you today, what would it be? Are you willing to trust that God will fix it in you? That God can fix it in you? Don't give up and don't give up hope. The people that we read about today got off to a bad start. But with God's help, we're able to turn it around. And you can turn things around too with God's help. God is on your side and God wants to prepare you for great things. Let's pray.